Okay, good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's my pleasure to come here and thank you, Sarah, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present at this meeting. So I'm um, just going to give uh, an overview of work I've done uh, with others at my institute on the quest to optimize HIV treatment outcomes in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'll just give a brief uh, overview of the HIV disease burden and then talk about work that we have done, translational studies that we have done, and then what it means for our policies and the way forward to improve our treatment outcomes. So briefly, we know that uh, over about 34 million people are living with HIV worldwide and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa carries a, a lion's share with 69% of the HIV-infected people and 72% of the world's HIV-related deaths. And today's antiretroviral therapy coverage is at about 38%, and this has gone a little bit down when the cutoff was increased to 500 cells. So um, antiretroviral therapy scale-up is still needed to attain universal access to HIV treatment. So this is the situation in Uganda, where I come from, in East Africa. The HIV prevalence is uh, about 8% among women and 6% among men. And the knowledge of HIV serious status is still at about 66% for women and 45% uh, for men. And currently our ART coverage uh, was at 39% when we are using a CD4 count of um, 350 for initiation of ART, but as we move to the WHO guidelines of 500, you can see that this figure goes down lower. So I'll briefly just talk about what happens in HIV infection. Um, we see that during the initial uh, infection, in the initial months, they have a high rise in viral load, and then the CD4 count goes down and um, here, are the, many of the patients have a few symptoms of acute uh, HIV infection. Um, after several months and years, then patients come to an, an asymptomatic stage with uh, a latency where the CD4 count, um, uh, the viral load goes down and the CD4 count uh, reduces slowly to uh, gradually, and patients are still asymptomatic uh, with more years of infection, then we have the CD4 counts shooting down to levels below 200, and this is when patients have severe opnistic infections. And uh, the viral load at this point goes up, and this is when we have the full-blown HIV disease. So this is the pathogenesis that has driven the ART initiation, where ART is, is mainly initiated at uh, CD4 counts below 200, and guidelines have been Increasing the cutoff over time it came to 350, and now it's at uh, 500 in the recent guidelines. So this is the WHO clinical staging. You see that stage three and four is when patients have advanced disease, and this is where we used to initiate antiretroviral therapy. But you know that with time now, we are beginning to initiate at with the test and treat strategies. Patients are being initiated at ART as early as possible. So I'll briefly talk about um, what we have done. And this will just show the concept of uh, my work is mainly to reduce morbidity and mortality by optimizing HIV treatment outcomes. This is mainly my work. And these are the different facets that we have looked at. Um, one, we see that we need to increase opportunities for HIV testing for people to know their HIV status and be able to access treatment. Then we need active detection of HIV, of co-infections such as TB, which increase the, uh, the immune suppression. These are co-infections and opportunistic infections. Uh, we need the timely initiation of ART. We need to reduce attrition and optimize adherence for us to get good clinical outcomes. Then we need to strike a balance between clinical, virological, and immunological monitoring for our patients in resource-limited settings. Uh, these are the ones that are mainly for HIV. We also have factors that are not necessarily for limited to HIV. We have health system strengthening, which again impacts on HIV care. And then we, we have um, training and mentoring of current and future leaders, 
which is capacity building for research that is going to take clinical care as a whole to the next level. And then we have to bridge the gap between evidence, policy, and practice. All this contributes to my overarching goal of optimizing HIV treatment outcomes. So my talk is going to be about the different areas in this and how it is related to our global health. So I started off uh, my work about 10 years ago where I was involved in a community clinical trial in the eastern part of uh, Uganda, rural Uganda. Uh, this is the place and we were involved in trying out simple interventions to improve HIV treatment outcomes. So here we are using a safe water system, uh, just providing clean water and cotrimoxazole prophylaxis. Um, so then we would follow in a clinical trial and patients were followed up every week to monitor clinical events, many diseases and febrile illnesses. This for, was for one and a half years. So we're seeing the effect of the safe water system alone and then the combined effect of the safe water system and cotrimoxazole. So our major finding in this trial was that uh, using a safe water system, uh, people using the safe water system had uh, like 25% fewer diarrhea episodes and 33% fewer days of the diarrhea. And this was before they initiated antiretrovirus therapy. Uh, again, cotrimoxazoprophylaxis was associated with a 46% reduction in mortality and reduced malaria rates and hospitalization. So then, safe water system and cotrimoxazoprophylaxis uh, reduced, uh, together reduced diarrhea episodes by 67% and the diarrhea days by about half. So with this, we concluded that a home-based safe water system reduced the area, frequency, and severity among people living with HIV, and, and cotrimoxazole cellular prophylaxis reduced morbidity and mortality. And both of these were already available and beneficial to HIV-infected people. So we recommended large scale-up of these interventions. So Cotrimoxas and, and uh, Safe Water System then were adopted by our Ministry of Health as part of the basic care package for people living with HIV. And Scale Up has since then been supported through several uh, first supported HIV care treatment programs in Uganda and other resource limited settings. So this is the publication that came out talking about the effects of uh, Cotrimoxas. It came out in, in the Lancet. And I was one of the co-authors. I participated on this as a study coordinator. Then we also published one on the effect of home-based water coordination. This was in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. So then I went to back to the hospital where I was uh, in Mulago National Referral Hospital, and I looked at routine HIV testing in the medical emergency unit, mainly because we found that many people were presenting, they were not having HIV testing, and they were presenting with late disease. So Mlago Hospital of, offers care for over 700,000 patients annually, and 50 to 70 percent of our admissions are HIV related. This picture shows uh, our ID ward. And at that time, we had no inpatient HIV testing and ART services. It was mainly ambulatory. So I set out to look at the acceptability of uh, routine HIV testing when offered in an acute care setting. So this was a cross-sectional study. We have two thirty-three patients, and we offered them provider-initiated HIV testing as part of routine medical care. So this is briefly of what, what we found. Uh, about 83% of our patients were coming in with unknown HIV serial status. And uh, many of the reasons given was uh, the cost and lack of perceived risk, and then fear to know their test results. And uh, about 66% of these had been to a health facility in the previous six months, but HIV testing had not been offered. And this is what we found. So it was highly acceptable. 95% of the patients accepted to receive an HIV test and were able to diagnose 77% of new infections during this time. So HIV testing was highly acceptable. It detected many undiagnosed infections and recommended routine HIV testing in the medical emergency unit to scale up HIV diagnosis and linkage to care. So again, among these patients, we looked at the eligibility for ART within the acute care setting. 
So this figure just shows the common causes of admission in the medical ward for HIV infected people. So this here we have the HIV positive people and HIV negative. Among the HIV positive people, we see that main admissions were due to respiratory tract infections and AIDS defining illnesses. And here we see that 50% of uh, people who were admitted uh, were HIV infected and 76% of them had received no prior HIV treatment before this admission. And uh, uh, about 78% of these were already in advanced uh, HIV disease needing treatment. So then we saw that there's a high burden of uh, HIV infection in the medical emergency unit. Uh, patients are, are presenting with advanced <coughs> disease without prior treatment. So recommended scale up of HIV AIDS care in acute care setting in order to increase access to antiretroviral therapy because of these, these presented missed opportunities. So on the policy side, uh, routine provider initiated HIV testing in the healthcare setting was then adopted as part of the Ministry of Health package, uh, HIV counseling and testing policy. And then uh, scale up again has been done for, by several PEPFA funded program to, to increase uh, HIV testing coverage which has risen from 11% in 2004 to 45% in 2011, and a survey, another survey is going on, see what it is now. And then uh, heart initiation during hospitalization was set up on our ID unit, which caters for infectious diseases, uh, including HIV AIDS, to reduce the missed opportunities for timely initiation of ART. So again, in our cohort, this is the, in the ambulatory cohort, we did a longitudinal study to look at routine TB screening in the HIV care program. Uh, here, we looked at all enrolled patients um, who were screened for TB using an algorithm that included clinical history, uh, physical exam, sputum analysis, plasma minus a chest x-ray, and then bronchoscopy for those who required it. And this was done at enrollment and through the HIV and through the follow-up in the clinic over three and a half years. So this is this figure will just show you how the clinic started in 2006 and then the numbers kept increasing within over, within one year. We had big numbers in the clinic. Mm -hmm. So there's an overwhelming demand for the HIV services. So over the three and a half years, we saw that. Uh, the TB incidence with this uh, routine screening, uh, we had five uh, per 100 person years, five cases per 100 person years in the patients who are not on antiretroviral therapy. So we had more TB cases reported in the patients who are on, on ART. But this, uh, you need to note that HIV patients were more followed up and than the HIV, than the non-ART patients. So, so we actually recommend that we have. Uh, Follow up for even the non HIV patients because most of them get lost follow up from care, the non ART patients. So, on sub analysis of the patients uh, who had instant TB, we see that um, about 50% of them got TB in the first 14 months of treatment. So, this is a critical time in the first year of treatment when we need to have aggressive um, diagnosis of TB. So again, this is at, was done at Mulago Hospital, and we concluded that routine TB screening and enrollment through follow-up identified this, a significant number of TB co-infections among both ART and non-ART patients, and this is a potential strategy for improving HIV treatment outcomes in resource-limited settings. Again, uh, we've had TB screening algorithm that we piloted in this study. It has been implemented in several HIV care programs, including uh, the IDI TB clinic, which was set up three years ago. So again, uh, because many of our patients were mothers, the epidemic in Uganda, about 60-70% are women. So we looked at the access to HIV AIDS care for mothers and children in Africa and looking at adherence to the PMTCT program. So in this study, our major findings was that only a third of the HIV-infected mothers adhere to the postnatal PMTCT program. So after PMTCT during pregnancy, it's only a third that are able to return for follow-up. 
and mothers who previously attended routine postnatal care were four times more likely to adhere to postnatal PMTCT. So there is actually need to improve maternal child health services alongside PMTCT programs if we are to move uh, option B plus forward. So from that previous study, I was then invited to contribute to a book chapter looking at scaling up of HIV AIDS care among women in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the cross-cultural barriers. This is a chapter in the book on women, motherhood, and living with HIV AIDS. And in this chapter, we really talk about critical social cultural issues that uh, affect mothers' access to HIV care in Africa. We talk about pregnancy and childbearing in the, social, in the African context. And then adolescence and the transition to, manhood, to womanhood, disclosure and its consequences, prevention with positives, breastfeeding and PMTCT, unique issues in Africa where mothers have to be seen breastfeeding. And then HIV epidemic in the conflict-affected areas, mainly in northern Uganda. And we also look at the fact that heart restores the hope for mothers in Africa, where they can have children and best feed them without transmitting HIV infection. So then I'll talk about the clinical trials that I've been involved in at the Infectious Disease Institute. The Infectious Disease Institute is um, our regional center of excellence in HIV care and research and training as well. As mentioned earlier, we offer HIV care to over 20,000 HIV infected people and up to 7,000 on antiretroviral therapy. The institute also supports through its outreach program, HIV care uh, centers within the country. So over 70,000 people are supported by IDI. Uh, so we receive several consultations for patients who are not responding to treatment and referrals from uh, sent several centers in the country. Uh, importantly, we have a research cohort that started off with 559 patients on antiretroviral therapy, and this cohort is nine years old. So um, most of the studies I'm going to talk about have been done in this research cohort. Patients receive uh, viral loads and CD4 counts every six months. So in this cohort, we looked at uh, suboptimal CD4 recovery these patients. This was a prospective cohort where I looked at uh, CD4 recovery in a setting of viral suppression. And this is what we define suboptimal recovery at six months, having a CD4 count increase of less than 50, of less than 100 after 12 months, and then less than 200 at 24 months. But we also looked at the failure to have a CD4 count above 500, above 200 cells, which is the cutoff when patients are at risk of uh, opnostic infections. So typically we find that um, almost uh, about 45% of, of our patients have poor CD4 recovery at one year, and this increases to 54% at 24 months in a setting of viral suppression. And we found that um, about 82% of the people who are suboptimal at uh, six months continue to have suboptimal CD4 recovery at 12 months. And uh, again, 58% continue to have suboptimal CD4 recovery after two years. So this is what set up to find out what is the impact of this. And we have done this analysis in a larger cohort, the uh, IDEA East African cohort, where we have more numbers to look at uh, clinical events, and we found that um, suboptimal immune responders actually had uh, more opnostic infections than optimal immune responders, even when they had uh, virus suppression. So suboptimal CD4 constitution is high in sub-Saharan Africa, and it increases the risk of opnostic infections. And many of the patients with suboptimal recovery at six months continue with the phenomena after two years. Uh, so there's need to understand the mechanisms and the uh, CD4 T cell function recovery in this subpopulation. So these are the post issues because uh, we need to increase access to routine CD4 in HIV care and treatment programs if we are to identify this population that do not respond well. Uh, so routine viral loads for poor CD4 responders are required for us to identify them. And then we need to increase adherence and retention in care to allow quality, high quality follow-up. So intervention to optimize immune, rec uh, immune recovery among suboptimal immune responders uh, 
required even when we have viral, viral suppression. So that is why we went out to look for some of the associated features like, and so we looked at T-cell activation and suboptimal CD4 recovery. Um, this is in the lab. We have the Gen Clinical Research Center in Kampala where we did these uh, lab assays. So this is just to give you a profile of alcohol, what it was at four years. We have about 252 patients who, are, who had sustained viral suppression for four years. And of these, uh, so 211 were eligible for the study. So we looked at the entire CD4 count resp responses, the increases, and then we, we grouped it into four quartile. The lowest quartile having suboptimal immune responders, people who had CD4 increases, a median increase of 129. So they all had CD4 counts below 200. And then the super immune responders who have CD4 counts above 500. And then these are the average responders. So in a case control study, we compared uh, immun immunological markers. We looked at immune activation. So what we found was there was high immune activation and immune exertion among the suboptimal responders compared to the optimal responders. This is just a picture to briefly show what we saw. We looked at CD, expression of CD38 and HLADR on CD4 and CD8 T cells. This picture shows what we have on the CD8 T cells. So here, we just have a typical patient, uh, a good responder who has low immune activation, and this is one presenting with uh, high immune activation. This is a suboptimal responder patient. So, and this is what we saw, what we present in one of, in, in the paper. Uh, there's significant uh, levels of immune activation in the suboptimal responders compared to the uh, optimal responders. So we conclude that T-cell activation and exertion persists despite long-term antiretroviral therapy with viral suppression and the immune abnormalities were associated with suboptimal CD4 reconstitution and therefore immune regulation may modify immune recovery among ART treated patients with suboptimal recovery. So this is just to give an overview of immune activation and HIV, and it is published. So we see that uh, there are several contributors to immune activation during HIV. It's smart factor. We have microbial translocation. We have persistent HIV replication. We have co-infections, like, for example, CMV, hepatitis C. And then we have activation of the dendritic cells. And then we have altered T regulatory function. And all these cause the persistent immune activation, it causes uh, even fibrosis, T cell exhaustion, and local inflammation of monocytes. And the result of this is impaired CD4 T cell recovery, and it has now recently been associated with endogen disease during HIV. So these are the dangers of immune activation that we want to to address. So we see that uh, immune activation, both CD4 and CD8 T cells and also as expressed by soluble CD14, have been independently associated with increased mortality among people living with HIV. And there's also increased morbidity due to non-AIDS defining illnesses like CNS, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney diseases among people living with HIV. And we have seen that the mechanisms of immune activation are multifactorial. Therefore, adjunct therapy with anti-immune activation agents could reduce morbidity and mortality among the treated patients. So this is uh, my hypothesis. So this is a our preliminary studies. We've done a hypothesis-driven trial to test the effect of anti-immune activation agents on immune activation among our treated suboptimal immune responders. And uh, of course, there are several anti-immune activation agents, one of them being hydroxychloroquine, which is a bit more toxic on long-term use. But we looked at uh, atovastatin which is FDA approved for dyslipidemias, but has shown anti-immune activation properties that are potentially beneficial for heart-treated uh, patients. So this is what we tried. And uh, we had suboptimal immune responders, and in a pilot trial, we randomized them to atovastatin 8 milligrams daily for 12 weeks and placebo. And this was a crossover trial where our patients had a washout period for four months and then switched treatments so this is uh, 
just a snapshot of the results we have, anti-immune activation effects of atovastatin among her treated suboptimal immune responders. So this figure shows uh, percentages of activated CD40 cells, and we see that um, for patients that have natovastatin, we had significant reduction in CD4 immune activation. Uh, again, on this figure, we see that the patients with natovastatin had significant immune activation uh, reduction of CD8 T cell activation, and in placebo, there was no significant reduction. And the trend is similar even with uh, exhaustion as expressed by a PD-1 marker. So here we see that anti-immune activation effects of atovastatin among suboptimal responders was seen after 12 weeks of the drug as adjunct to antiretroviral therapy. And the effects were not maintained during the washout period. Therefore, long-term therapy may be required. And we also found that the this 12-week pilot wasn't enough for us to determine um, the effects on CD4 recovery and other clinical outcomes. But this was a proof of concept that has been accepted for publication, and we want to build on this to make a larger trial. So there are unanswered questions from this. So one, we don't know that starting adjunct therapy is safe at heart initiation, where we think that patients have the highest uh, levels of immune activation due to untreated HIV. And then we have also not answered whether short and long term clinical benefits uh, are there among patients initiating ART, particularly at CD4 counts below 500. Remember, our cohort we all started in treatment at, at below 200. And we also want to know the effects of atovastatin on drug interactions, for example, with ART, uh, efavirenz, and a VIP based regimen. And we also don't know what the effect is on patients who have co-infections, such as TB. So these are yet to be answered in our future trial. So this is the proposed trial. Um, it's a factorial design where we shall have adults who are ART naive being initiated on ART at CD4 counts below 500. And uh, this will be randomized to atovastatin and placebo. It will be a double-blind controlled trial. And then we shall have an also randomizing patients to rifampicin and, and INH presumptive treatment and no NIH and no RH. So these patients will then be monitored for 24 months to monitor clinical outcomes, immune activation, and we also look at uh, transcriptional profiling and pharmacokinetic studies to understand the drug-drug interactions with anti-TB treatment and ART. So then we shall be able to evaluate the effect of atovastatin um, versus placebo and the effect of uh, presumptive TB treatment on immune activation and clinical outcomes. So this is the trial we are working on with Sarah, and hopefully it should start next year. So what is the impact of this trial? Um, we think that immunological and clinical benefits of atovastatin adjunct therapy will inform therapeutic interventions to utilize immune modulants um, um, in order to maximize HIV treatment outcomes. We also think that this will modify uh, the risk of morbidity and mortality due to non-AIDS defining illnesses, which have, where we have shown that uh, immune activation contributes to this. And we believe that this will cause a paradigm shift to HIV treatment care to optimize treatment outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we've also done other translational studies in the area of uh, immune recovery and treatment outcomes of HIV treatment. This I will just give a snapshot. So we found that there is impaired T cell proliferation among the heart-treated adults with suboptimal CD4 recovery in our African cohort. Um, we've also found that there was uh, there is partial recovery of the innate immune system. For example, the NK cells, we found that there's still high, these uh, CD56 byte NK cells, which are pro-inflammatory. These are again higher among the patients who have suboptimal immune recovery. We've also found that there is low antigen-specific CD40 cell immune responses, despite normal CD4 counts. Even when people recover and have CD4 counts above 500, they still have low antigen-specific immune responses compared to HIV negative counterparts. So we've also seen that there is subclinical atherosclerosis among our HIV-treated patients. 
and later patients. So there's also increased risk of cardiovascular disease among patients who are aging on, with HIV. And the risks are also much factorial. Again, we've also seen that um, there's t uh, t CD4 T cell activation and regulatory T cell dysfunction was associated with early development of cataracts among HIV treatment adults. So there's a lot of interaction between inflammation, immune activation, and non aids defining illnesses that we have seen in our cohort. So really, my major goal is to be able to translate laboratory research to inform patient care practices. So we have patient care problems here, immune recovery, and then we go to the lab to try to find the predictors and then be able to get treatment interventions that can help our patients on treatment. So again, we wrote up a review to look at the strategies to optimize HIV treatment outcomes in resource settings. And this review, uh, based on the high numbers of patients that we have and the limited facilities, so we wanted to look at which are the critical issues that we need to do to scale up HIV treatment. So it's mainly scaling up HIV testing opportunities, uh, active linkage of the HIV-infected people to comprehensive HIV care, and then improving diagnosis and treatment of opportunistic infections like we have talked about, and then timely initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Again, other strategies, we talk about reducing uh, early mortality due to ART by screening for opportunistic infections and treating them. And then uh, follow up and reducing retention and treatment interruption in our patients. And then integrating HIV prevention in HIV care programs by using people living with HIV, uh, increasing access to utilization of PMTCT, and then scaling up safe male circumcision, and then research on evidence-based models of HIV care. So this is what we have come up as our comprehensive care package. And then, of course, continued lobbying for funding to sustain um, uh, HIV care, both nationally and internationally. So, and we have also seen that it's important to translate all the research to policy and bridge the gap between evidence, practice, and policy. So again, we looked at the policy processes within our means of health, and we identified some gaps that need to be handled. For example, there's limited engagement of the policy analysis unit, inadequate tracking and evaluation of policy revision, policies before revision, lack of specific protocols, limited indigenous funding to support the activities, and then non-adherence to anticipated timelines. These are gaps we identified in the, trans, in the translation to policy, which we have presented to our means of health to be able to work on. So we recommend active involvement of the policy analysis unit, capacity building of the means of health policy analysis, and then specific SOPs for doing this. And of course, there is, in general, health system strengthening, which is supporting both HIV and non-HIV care practices. So there's, it is critical for quality of healthcare in Uganda. This is just an example to show the variability in the healthcare system. Because this is, we did this in a malaria study where we were looking at, we found that microscopy was available for, at only 24% of the primary care facilities. Now in Uganda and other countries in Africa, microscopy is the very basic thing that we should be having in the healthcare system. Then we found that 15%, only 15% had functional inpatient facilities, uh, less than half experienced three months uh, long drug stock out, then 18% of the means of health approved positions were filled. This was just in the malaria, so if we have the same for HIV and other NCDs, we need to do health system strengthening to improve this. So and all this will require training and mentoring, so these are, this is critical to support current and future leaders in health. So. We have looked at the mentoring gaps we have. We have a low critical mass of mentors, limited time allocated for mentorship, for research, and because of many overwhelming clinical activities. So there's a need for mentoring best practices and then institutionally driven mentoring programs and then collaborative approach to mentorship to be able to support our professionals to engage in research to improve care. 
So what is the way forward? One, we need to continue engagement, increase engagement in collaborative research to improve patient care. We need a multidisciplinary approach because as we've seen, the HIV disease is affecting several disciplines and translational science that can be transformed to improve uh, healthcare practices. So translation of research to policy, support to the health, uh, healthcare systems, and then mentorship to keep the pipeline of scientists, clinicians, and research leaders that will support this. So I believe that together we can improve healthcare delivery in Uganda and other resource limited settings. And we will use the HIV care and treatment programs as platforms to improve healthcare delivery. Well, this picture, I like this picture, it shows uh, some of our HIV infected patients at the IDI that have been able to pull through, improve, and you can see them enjoying and dancing here. This is what we want to happen to all our patients. Yeah. Thank you. I wish to acknowledge all the people that have been involved with us in this. Thank you very much.